So thank you for joining us for the Summer 2022 Symposium, GS Symposium. As you just saw on your screens, uh, this session is being recorded. So if you prefer not to be recorded, then please turn off your cameras. As part of the GES degree requirement, every GES student is con uh, must conduct a faculty mentored research experience, which includes writing a thesis, publicly presenting their results, which is what we're doing today, and taking uh, questions from the audience, which we are also doing today. Uh, there are three presenters today in the summer symposium. Each student will be briefly introduced by their faculty mentor before they give their presentation and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, after each student has spoken, uh, you can unmute, unmute yourselves and uh, briefly congratulate them. Otherwise, please keep your microphones off and hold off putting any uh, comments in the chat until the presentation is over. Uh, I will moderate the Q&A sessions as needed. If you have a question, please uh, raise your hand using the reactions button uh, or type your question into the chat or just type into the chat that you would like to ask a question. Uh, we do have uh, you know, a set time for each student. So I do apologize up front if we don't get to all your questions. Okay, with that all said, I'd like to introduce our first mentor, uh, Dr. Parker Clay Trainish. I hope I got that somewhere close. Close enough, close enough. Thanks, so I'll uh, take it away. Yeah, so uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce Tanner um, to, to talk about prescribed fire in Hawaii. And we, uh, Tanner bugged me and kind of chased me down. I have to like commend you for your persistence because um, I was trying to kind of hard to reach for a while there. And I think, um, you know, he he had this idea to to look at the use of prescribed fire as fire mitigation in Hawaii. And I remember starting that conversation to tell him it, it was a bit of a challenge because there's just not a lot going on here, right? There's just, it's very limited in scope. And he, he'll kind of talk about that, I think, today. Um, but so it sort of became something different than I think that he envisioned and that I had envisioned in the sense that it was more about trying to get on the ground and, and talk to folks, talk to the, the firefighters themselves about just where and why uh, either they, they are starting to think about using it or, or where they, they can actually do it. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a really cool, relevant topic for um, practitioners here, for the firefighters themselves. There's big interest in applying it. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of things that come into play about why it's not being used. And I just, uh, I just like to add to that is that, you know, Tanner really kind of took this off uh, on his own. I, I kind of pointed him in the direction, explained where it's happening and where it isn't happening. And he just uh, really took the lead and in, in reaching out to folks. And, and again, it went from something where we had these ideas to do like a lot of quantitative stuff to more in the direction of a, more like a social science project is because really was talking with folks to try to understand where they can and cannot implement this stuff and why from, from an agency perspective. So um, yeah, Tanner, uh, thanks for putting the time into this and uh, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Awesome, thank you, Clay. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tanner. Uh, the title of my presentation is an assessment of prescribed burns in Hawaii to identify the training opportunities and limitations to mitigating long-term damage of wildfires to the local communities and the ecosystem. The next slide. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so I want to start off by just kind of saying what are prescribed burns. So prescribed burns are also known as controlled burns. Uh, specifically in Hawaii, they are used to uh, for fuel mitigation and to 
prevent wildfires that occur during the dry season from spreading uh, too far and burning up too much land. Uh, as uh, Dr. Charney said, there are few organizations that conduct prescribed burns in Hawaii, and the uh, two that I focused on were the Maui Fire Department and the Army Fire Department uh, on Schofield Barracks. And this image here shows uh, one of the images from the annual prescribed burn up at Schofield that I was able to observe uh, this past summer. So one thing I wanted to touch on was the non-native plant species, invasive plant species cause more fires in Hawaii. Um, these include guinea grasses and shrubs such as the halikoa. They're because they're, they spread so quickly and uh, they're major fuel sources for fires out here, uh, which makes it very difficult to uh, kind of pinpoint and treat those areas. So one thing I noticed is that understanding these, these growth rates and kind of the locations where these invasive species are prevalent uh, can help to, <clears throat> excuse me, adjust our uh, prescribed burn frequency and location um, to accomplish these fuel mitigation uh, objectives that the Army Fire Department and the Maui Fire Department are aiming at. Uh, I also wanted to cover how, raise the question of how the communities and the ecosystem are affected by these wildfires. Uh, so we know that non-native plants contribute to uh, extreme wildfire extent in Hawaii. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to ask how badly is this actually affecting the local communities and the ecosystem? And Hawaii burns, uh, has burned 0.5% of the land annually. Uh, and as a percentage of land compared to other states, it's the highest in the country. And part of that reason is because 98% of wildfires are due to human activity, whether that's direct uh, like arson or that's just uh, due to fireworks, campfires, and uh, other human in inflicted reasons. Uh, and one of the things that I was noticing when I was doing this research is that excess wildfires not only uh, burn the land and harm the native ecosystem, they're uh, hardening the soil, which makes regrowth for these native plants challenging. And it also increases runoff, which contributes to more nutrient runoff down into the ocean and flash floods. So going back to the purpose of prescribed burns in Hawaii, obviously one of the main objectives is fuel mitigation, but I wanted to kind of touch on why uh, that, why that is. And uh, so Schofield specifically, they, this is part, this picture over here on the right is part of the range that I was um, viewing. I actually took this picture as that Black Hawk was flying over the perimeter of the burn, the control burn area to prevent it from spreading up the mountain. And they conduct this burn every year. And this year it took three days and it varies from uh, year to year based on weather. Uh, but they do this to keep the range from, from burning too much in the drier season. And one of the reasons that Maui Fire Department conducts their prescribed burns frequently is because 60% of people in Maui live in these high-risk areas, which high-risk meaning um, the potential for a wildfire to spread into those urban areas is, is, is high. Uh, Furthermore, 20% of Maui's total land has been burned, which is equivalent to about 150 square miles. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but the total land area of Maui is only 727 square miles. So it's pretty significant in terms of the size of the island. Um, so I believe that communicating these burn plans uh, between agencies and communicating them to the uh, communities can help increase preparedness and a uh, sense of safety among the local community in preparation for these dry seasons. Uh, so one thing that I did was I, I gathered fire ignition data and I found burn parameters and 
the what I wanted to do was first find out where like the majority of wildfires in Hawaii were occurring. And I also wanted to see if they varied from island to island. I also wanted to figure out what the burn parameters were, meaning that uh, there's the burn parameters are, are weather and temperature and relative humidity. And those will all play a factor in uh, conducting a safe controlled burn. Uh, so what I found from this data entry was I got a bunch of data from my mentor and I took all of the, all of the points where wildfires started and I made a map of that, which I'll show you soon. And I had found that a lot of the fires, vary, wildfires vary from island to island. On Oahu, they're more around urban areas around where there's a lot of, uh, just a lot of homes and um, it's a lot like tighter. Uh, in Maui, the areas are, the wildfires are occurring more around rural areas and flat, drier areas. So what I found from that is that prescribed burn techniques may need to vary depending on the location and also just due to the tropical environment of Oahu and Maui, it makes it, uh, it makes it more difficult to track because these fires can occur year round, even though they're more prevalent in the dry season, they can still occur all year round. Um, there is currently a website in place with the National Weather Service that is a Hawaiian fire weather products service, which gives a generalized idea of when it's safe to conduct a control burn, but it doesn't necessarily pinpoint the differences in regions around the islands. Uh, so this is the maps. Um, the one on the right is Oahu, which I gathered from previous data that was already collected. And the data on the left with Maui uh, is the data that I collected. The circles there I wanted to point out is mainly because those are where uh, the majority of control burns are being conducted on these islands. And all of the other dots are where wildfires are occurring. So of course, it's not a perfect technique, but there seems to be a trend where control burns, prescribed burns are occurring there are less wildfires, and even if there are, they're smaller in size. Um, so now I'm going to talk about kind of what I did when I went to this, this prescribed burn at Schofield Barracks. Uh, this was the field research. I was able to go and observe this prescribed burn over three days. Um, so I... I went there for about an hour or two each day, and what I gathered from that was the uh, the burn boss there, who is Justin Turnbow. He uh, spoke with me, and I was able to interview him and ask him questions about the procedures. And um, he gave me a 12-page incident action plan that he told me about, and that included everything from uh, the primary and secondary objectives to the contingency plan. Is who in who in all all is involved in that. I also was able to interview uh, officials from the Maui Fire Department, Honolulu Fire Department, and the Department of Forestry and Wildlife on Big Island to get all their different perspectives on what they felt uh, would be effective as far as conducting prescribed burns in more areas around Oahu and um, the state. And what I gathered from that was that the four main concerns that everybody seemed to be in agreement with was the topography, the limited land in Hawaii, the community safety and awareness, and the fragile native ecosystem. So topography is always a concern because of whether or not um, it's safe at a time to conduct a controlled burn. Um, if relative humidity is high and temperature and wind speed are high, then you may be able to conduct a control burn. But if you're near like a more mountainous region, like where they conduct in Schofield, if the wind is too, uh, is above a certain amount of miles per hour, it doesn't matter what the other ranges, what the other burn parameters are, it's not safe to conduct a control burn because it can just ladder up the side of the mountain. 
Uh, I also touched on comparing mainland agencies and their burn plans. So the what I gathered from extensive burn plans and mainland agencies who've been doing this for years is that everybody seems to have a general consensus that the first goal of all of these control burns because they're so high risk should be and always has been safety. Uh, there are of course other goals such as fuel management and smoke pollution uh, minimalization and um, just to put the community at ease, make them not basically flood the phone lines, the emergency lines about like concerns with the smoke. Uh, and some differences included uh, pre pre burn practices and the frequency of burns. Some places on the mainland, because they have different climates, they don't have to conduct burns as frequently as they do in Hawaii, which makes it much more difficult to conduct them in Hawaii because of the tropical region. It requires more uh, more frequent burns on the mainland. They can do them anywhere from five to 20 years on Oahu and other parts of the state. Uh, they need to be done more of like an annual thing. Uh, as far as providing training opportunities for Hawaii personnel, obviously there's not a lot going on as my mentor stated. So we need to train these first responders or they need to be trained. Uh, on this to be prepared to actually fight them in the future. And so one thing was to, uh, one thing that I talked to the Department of Forestry and Wildlife representative about was that uh, they have a state to state agreement with the uh, Arizona to conduct prescribed burns there with specific personnel, which then can come back to Hawaii and train the rest of the personnel to conduct these prescribed burns. And so I was trying to kind of figure out a way of like standardizing these burn practices, uh, which I found was a lot more feasible to do when taking bits from mainland agencies, but not trying to combine them all as one, mainly because of the differences. In, uh, but, oh, excuse me. As far as uh, standardizing in Hawaii, uh, Safety needs to be the number one goal. Obviously, with every prescribed burn plan, they're high risk and they need to be treated with care. Uh, we also can consider utilizing the National Guard and Army pilots to wet down the burn perimeters prior to burns and uh, on standby for contingency purposes in case the fire burns past uh, the, the perimeter of where they are conducting the burn. Um, ideally, all of these burns, because the living land in Hawaii, should be small targeted burns. And that's what I gathered from all of my interviews is that nobody really wanted to do any burns that were not small and targeted at these invasive plant species. Also, I wanted to consider creating a public awareness notification system so that it the community involvement is a lot larger than what I originally expected when starting this presentation or when starting this research and so uh, informing the community is a huge part about um, of concern when conducting these prescribed burns. So my overall conclusion is that I believe that conducting prescribed burns on Oahu is feasible and it can be very beneficial to uh, establishing a uh, healthy and safe community and ecosystem long term, especially with the changing climate. And uh, I noticed that some of the requirements are going to be a set of standardized safety protocols between all the departments and knowing the weather parameters based on each region, whether or not it's going to be near the base of a mountain, whether or not it's going to be in a flat, drier area around urban areas, or around world, they tend to change, not a ton, but they do change based on the regions and they need to be uh, paid attention. Um, of course, we need to adhere to the Hawaiian Fire Weather Products, which is given by the National Weather Service. And also the methods may vary from island to island. 
So that needs to be evaluated at each burn location prior to conducting those burns. And future research also needs to be conducted on these weather parameters due to the ever-changing climate. They, the burn parameters, I don't see them changing drastically, but I do see them potentially changing enough in the future that that needs to be paid attention to uh, as time goes on. And ultimately, the decision to conduct these burns, whether or not they take my advice for it or not, uh, is up to each department's fire operations management team, which are uh, through each fire department. It is all ultimately up to them whether or not they decide it's safe enough and whether or not the risk or the reward outweighs the risk. Uh, finally, I'd just like to say a huge mahalo nui to everybody that made this presentation possible. Um, thank you for listening. Sorry I went a little bit over time, but uh, thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm going to unmute and uh, yeah, congratulate Tana or just put a reaction in. Yes, congratulations, brother. Good job. Okay, do we have any questions? Uh, let's start and see if we've got any questions from students. If, uh... I have a question. Um, so why is it that Maui seems to have uh, more of a, a higher risk than the other islands? Um, I mean, I feel from, from what I had taken from the interviews with the Maui uh, fire department officials is that the, the, with just the fact that a lot less people live on the island, a lot more of those areas are untouched and have a lot more like drier vegetation. So it's just, it's easier for during like the dry season for those to burn in those, like ignite in those areas and spread into uh, where there's people basically living. And considering that there's not even like, that the population density is extremely different between Maui and Oahu. Uh, those people just tend to kind of live like near that area. Um, but it's not, it's not like a, it's not a perfect science. Of course, like, like I said, due to the tropicalness of like the whole state, it, it's very sporadic at like, and it changes from year to year. Uh, but yeah. So. And we got time for a very quick question from Ed Wolf. Okay, you mentioned that um, a lot of these burns are targeting invasive species. Uh, do they ever burn native species? Um, of course, that is a possibility, especially with how prevalent invasive species can be on Oahu and other islands. They, I mean, they grow along right with the native plants, um, but they do... Um, what I've uh, talked to the Maui Fire Department about is that uh, these areas where there is a lot of uh, guinea grasses and holicoa growing in these areas, they kind of take over those native plants and they kind of just like completely like take over that region. And so even if you're, even if they are burning out some of the native plants, uh, by burning out all of the invasive species as well, it gives the native plants an opportunity to have room to grow back. And that's also why they keep them small and targeted, because if they do burn too much, they can affect a lot of the native plants as well. So, Yeah, well, I just comment there. Uh, some years ago, the National Park Service on the Big Island wanted to get rid of the in invasive grasses in the park. And they decided to do this by burning it. It turned out to be completely futile. The grasses love to be burned. The, the below ground part doesn't die. It just springs back up again. And so to their chagrin, they discovered if they want to get rid of the invasive plants, they need to dig them up, which was a lot more work than setting fire to them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because the, the, the prescribed burns don't 
always they they don't always get the root systems obviously and uh yeah because it rains so much here and they're able to like grow back so quickly it is something to take into consideration yeah okay okay um uh, last 10 well we'll ask all the speakers to stay on after you know in case you have extra questions but now we need to move on so our second uh student presentation will be introduced by uh Professor Allison Ujic. Hi everyone. It's my honor today to introduce Erickson. He was born on Oahu and raised on Maui. And ever since he can remember, he's been interested in airplanes. His father used to take him to see model aircraft. And since middle school, he has been building, crashing and flying homemade planes. He originally went to the University of Portland for mechanical engineering, but after taking an oceanography class, decided to come back to Hawaii to pursue GES. Now here's where Erickson gets really, really clever. <laughs> Since learning that there was a thesis requirement for GES, he figured out a way to do both. He figured out a way to incorporate his love of aircraft with environmental science. So the project you'll hear about today is the result of that. And as you will see, He's a very talented aircraft builder and flyer and crasher. <laughs> and I'll just say that he did 100% of this work on his own because we were separated during COVID. He was on Maui and I was on Oahu. And he's he's done a really amazing job with this, with this project, as you'll see. So take it away, Erickson. Thank you, Allison. All right. So um, hello and welcome. I'm Erickson Scholl, and I'll be presenting my design thesis on developing a low-cost, fixed-wing, uncrewed aerial vehicle for atmospheric sensing. So to introduce you, unmanned or uh, uncrewed aerial vehicles have become an essential tool to atmospheric and earth sensing due to their ease of use, cost of operation, transportability, and ability to perform a multitude of roles based on their sensor suite. Uh, due to these attributes, both rotary and fixed-wing uh, UAVs have become increasingly popular in data collection. Um, what I'm doing is building a low cost, easy to construct fixed wing aircraft, giving researchers the ability to cover large areas quickly and with minimal effort while creating a platform that is easy to modify to fit specific mission parameters. So for this fuselage, um, it was originally constructed of foam board. Uh, then I went on to extruded polystyrene and finally corrugated plastic. Um, Interior cargo space, weight, complexity, and strength were taken into consideration for each iteration. However, uh, ultimately corrugated plastic um, won. This corrugated plastic sheet was cut into one monolithic piece and folded into an elongated box. Uh, this means there was no separated panels for it to break away in a crash. Um, and one bulkhead was epoxied into the center of the body to increase rigidity uh, in the center of the fuselage. Um, the corrugated plastic design allows for a good balance between strength, weight, cost, and complexity. Uh, as for the wings, um, the wings also had to take weight, strength, and complexity into design uh, considerations. Um, and after a few prototypes, I found that extruded polystyrene was the best material candidate. Um, in order to cut this, I used a, a method called hot wire cutting. And basically what it is, is um, taking a nickel chromium wire and stretching it over a stretcher bar and putting current through it. And that basically just heats it up so that you can melt the foam into whatever shape you want. In this case, uh, airfoil. Um, and originally the wings had a carbon spar that went throughout the center that gave it rigidity, but I found after a few iterations that uh, packing tape was actually sufficient. So some other materials incorporated into this design uh, include packing tape, uh, epoxy, zip ties, aluminum bar stock, all of this could be easily found at a local hardware store. I found all of mine at Home Depot, um, making it easy for anybody to construct. Uh, so for data transmission, what I was using was a uh, FreeSky um, Tyrannus X7, um, and it controlled only three of the principal controls, um, throttle, ailerons, and elevator. Um, as you can see, uh, the ailerons were on the wings and the elevators on the tail. That controls the pitch and the roll axis. And for the motor setup, I'm using a 1100 kV uh, motor. And that's just basically a marketing term. kV is uh, revolutions per volt. Um, 
paired with a 40 amp ESC, which is a, uh, a little bit overkill, but it's better safe than sorry, on a 2200 milliamp three cell lithium polymer battery. Um, and this is all being transmitted uh, through this receiver, or the controls from the operator are being transmitted through the receiver to a res uh, one on to the um, plane. And it has a theoretical range of about two kilometers. So for the first iteration, um, I chose to go with a flying wing. Uh, this flying wing used a KF2 airfoil. Um, that's this step down. Uh, and what I found was that it was really easy to construct, but it was too fast um, and actually too maneuverable for what I needed. And once fully built uh, and flying, it actually didn't have enough room for the electronics. So I dished this design for the next um, design which was, uh, I started to call them versions and marks. So version for the body and marks for the wing. Um, the version, version one body uh, was foam board and it was actually too heavy to fly. Um, it was really strong. However, uh, due to it not getting off the ground, I swapped some designs. The version two body is actually just a cut down version one with a slightly longer wing. Um, as you can see in the rear, you, there's carbon spars that run to the tail. Uh, this would be reminiscent of the latest iteration, as you'll see later. Unfortunately, I was using a seven inch prop, which did not give it enough thrust for what was needed. So I went on to the next design, the version three body. This is made of extruded polystyrene and cut using a, a hot wire and sanded down to get its final design. It's uh, in a Cessna-esque shape and it uses a twin motor design, which had more than enough thrust um, with the seven inch, dual seven inch props. Unfortunately, uh, because it was made of extruded polystyrene, it was far more fragile than the previous iterations. In the first test flight, it actually, I crashed and um, had to splint the nose with two carbon spars. Uh, and after this, I decided that the Cessna-S design was um, too wasteful in the tail, and went on to a new design, which was based off of the old design. However, I used corrugated plastic sheets, um, and this would be the first design to incorporate that. It was a lot easier to construct, and it had the same wing as the last iteration um, with the dual motor setup. Um, but again, that wasted space actually in the tail meant that I couldn't use it for anything. And I actually had the center of gravity uh, pushed too far back. Um, I didn't realize this when I was building it. However, I figured out during test flights that it was inherently tail heavy, leading to this stalling characteristic as seen in the second photo. So um, going on, I pushed forward with something that looks similar to the mark or the version two body. Um, this is a six foot wing uh, extruded polystyrene. Um, and it's, it's, what I'm trying to do is uh, push the final design to its limits. So this was far longer than it needs to be, um, making it hard to maneuver and hard to transport, but it was very stable in the air. And I just wanted to see how it would perform. Unfortunately, due to this length, even with carbon spars running throughout it, um, I found that there were, uh, the wings were too flexible still. And this actually led to its crash. Um, in the second photo, you can see that the body actually detached from the wings, which happened mid-flight, leading to its crash. But as you'll note, the body itself isn't intact. Um, for this latest iteration, I incorporated a multitude of design uh, aspects from previous iterations. Um, it's using the corrugated plastic, the extruded polystyrene, aluminum booms for the tail, um, as seen right here, instead of carbon, because they're easier to find in hardware stores. And um, that same 1100 kV motor setup that uh, I originally talked about. Um, it's very durable and uh, was actually able to hold over twice the battery capacity um, than, originally, than I originally proposed. For data gathering, uh, Dr. Allison Nugent actually recommended I use a Intermet IMET XQ2. Uh, which logs pressure, temperature, humidity, and position. Um, and I use MATLAB to visualize this data. Uh, in order to interface with the Intermet XQ2, I had to hook it up to a laptop, which means 
every flight had to be successful once I did have the final iteration. Um, for the location, we chose Kualoa Regional Park. It's a remote park that's over on the windward side of the island of Oahu. Um, samplings were taken about 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and because of its uh, lo remote location, it was away from most crowds and it had a large landing area, which was uh, perfect for my application. And um, we went on five consecutive weekends uh, on Fridays, starting in February. February. So here's one of the flight paths that uh, I took. Um, the colored dots are the temperature. Uh, the data was taken at one hertz. And um, what you can see is that it's logging its position, longitude, latitude, its altitude. And um, it's what this is showing is like a story. It's, it's showing where it's went, it has gone. And it goes from zero to 120 meters, which is the legal flying limit for UAVs. Uh, and what did we find? So we actually found that this area was super adiabatic. Um, so super adiabatic conditions come about when a particle of air is cooled over 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. This leads to air that is highly unstable. Um, unstable air can lead to rapidly changing weather. Uh, weather. And um, going into the sampling phase, uh, we initially thought that it would be, the air would be around the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Um, this is because we thought the land at 8 a.m. wouldn't be as warm, uh, leading to not such a drastic change in temperature from zero to 120 meters. Um, and in conclusion, what we found was that this plane was able to take up sensors successfully and bring back the data intact. Um, and through the iterations, I found that form was greater than function. Um, it's not the prettiest plane ever, and uh, it's not going to win any design rewards, but it's strong, it's functional, and it's reliable. Um, but when it does crash, and it does crash uh, in a fatal way, the airframes only cost about $50. And of course, they're all, all the materials can be easily found at a local hardware store. Um, when using this for weather observation, I'd suggest using it in conjunction with other weather observation tools, such as uh, weather stations or soundings. Um, and I also found that wind was a huge uh, factor in flight operation. This, when, when there's wind, there's, it affects the battery life because you're having to use more power to get through the wind. Um, it affects the flight performance. Um, crosswinds can easily pitch or dive the nose of the plane, um, leading it harder to keep in a straight line. And um, it's th this plane is really ideal for flying under 15 knot winds, which is about 17 kilometer or 17 miles per hour. Um, I'd like to thank Europe for helping fund this, as well as Dr. Allison Nugent for being a wonderful professor to work with. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, join me in uh, congratulating Ericsson. Nicely done. Okay, do we have any questions from, oh, we already have lots of questions. Um, so we'll start with students again. Um, wow, lots of them. Uh, Petra. I'm just congratulating. Oh, all right, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so anybody here, any students have a question? Okay, Ed, uh, you want to ask a question? Okay, I, I'm just intrigued that uh, you had these episodes of crashing when you were oh, first it. trying to get this plane to fly. And I, I couldn't help think of the Wright brothers. They actually get in the plane. I mean... Were they just lucky, or is what's, or were you just unfortunate, or what? Um, well, I guess it's both. Uh, there is a, there's definitely. Hmm, how should I say this? To me, it's more of a feel um, when I'm building a plane. There's situations in which I feel like this plane would work perfect. And you can kind of get it close where um, you can get 
calculators online to figure out your center of gravity on your plane um, and where it would be ideal. You want your center of lift to be behind your center of gravity so that um, you don't have a tumbling aircraft or something that wants to stall. And so it, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, if you're if you don't have you know years and years of aerodynamics behind your uh, study, so I guess it's a it's a both um, luck and and persistence. Yeah, I mean it's, it seems provocative to me listening to you that these guys got in the plane and didn't kill themselves. <laughs> um, but, There's a lot of the okay. first flights. Where, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Steve? Hi. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. First, the comment, the Wright brothers had um, had wind tunnels. They actually did aerodynamic testing before they got in the plane. Um, I could ask a bunch of questions, but the one that comes to mind at the moment is that pressure and temperature measurements from airplanes are actually kind of tricky because mm -hmm the speed of the airplane gives you a dynamic pressure, mm -hmm. which is how airspeed is usually measured in small aircraft. And also that raises the temperature. Did you do corrections for that or mount your instruments in a way to correct for that? So the only mounting I did was putting it in a low pressure zone behind the wing. Um, but I actually did not do any corrections. Um, in terms of that, uh, these, yeah, I just didn't do any corrections. Was the plane going fast enough that these corrections would actually be significant? Um, no, not really. So we're flying under 30 kilometers per hour. Um, the speeds that I'm flying at shouldn't really make too much of a difference. Uh, in fact, I actually tried using a pitot tube to make, to get dynamic and static pressure. And I actually found that it was too inaccurate um, for the speeds I was flying. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Erickson. And our final speaker today will be introduced by her mentor, Craig Nelson. Yeah, aloha, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> it is my pleasure and pride to introduce today Sophia Suesui, who hails from uh, the northern windward shore, Ko'olaloa, Paula to be specific, um, and she's coming to us from Windward Community College, where she got her AA degree um, and enrolled in our Mauka to Mackay program, which is where she was introduced to GES. Um, and in the time that she's been here and before, she's been, she's done a, a crazy number of research programs, including an RU in Oregon, um, and has had a UROP fellowship as well as a PICAST fellowship during her time here, which she's written grants for. Um, and both of those were focused on coastal pollutants in the Kahalu watershed, which is an area she's very interested in working on problems that face our state, that face our water, and she's always been really passionate about that. Uh, Sophia's been an absolute pleasure to mentor, along with my co-mentor, Henrietta Dulai. Um, and she's just one of the most genuine, pleasant, and engaged students I've ever had the pleasure of mentoring. Um, I always look forward to our weekly meetings, even though half the time I'm late. Um, she's always just sitting there smiling, waiting for me, which I vastly appreciate, especially lately. Um, and even after she mostly completed her, her dissertation, her thesis research in the in the spring. Uh, she's now spent the, the summer doing more research uh, with Kiana Frank and PBRC. Um, so she's really passionate about research and um, we're really looking forward to her continued training science. And we know that however she turns out, she's gonna keep focusing on the issues that we have locally in our water. And for that, I'm just really grateful. So take it away, Sophia. Thank you. Uh, oh, got it. Thank you so much. Um, so, hi, my name is Sophia Suesue, and my project is on microbial community response to contaminants of emerging concern in the Kaneohe watershed. Uh, here's a brief outline of my talk, 
my talk and all the topics I'll be going over, including the study site and the specific um, topics. So to begin, I wanted to go, uh, go over how over here and throughout many uh, Pacific Islands, water travels relatively quick from Malka to Makai, and during that it picks up nutrients, sediments, and everything else that we put into our streams, including pollutants. This may be something that we can overlook sometimes until large flooding events like this. This actually happened near where I live in Haula, and the stream overflowed, and you really think about what's in our streams when it's going through your yard. But this is happening um, pretty much every day continuously through many different pathways, and a significant pathway is non-point source and groundwater pollution into our coast and our streams. So non-point source pollution is more continuous and diffuse. We can't find the direct point where it's coming from, and it can it includes our surface runoff, which includes herbicides and insecticides that we use um, on our yards. Uh, there's also another big uh, problem specifically in our islands, which are on-site sewage disposal systems, which include cesspools and septic tanks. And especially for cesspools, there's the issue of leaching, uh, like the my figure over here shows that cesspool leaching um, can contain contaminants that goes into our groundwater, which can affect our aquifer supply, as well as going into our coasts and streams. Uh, this can lead to potential groundwater contamination. So what are some common contaminants that are in our runoff and um, cesspool leach it? Well, the big portion of that are contaminants of emerging concern, or CECs for short. Uh, pollutants source from uh, human activity that can potentially cause ecological and human health harm, and they're not really currently regulated under environmental laws. Uh, their presence has been recorded within the Kaneohe watershed on the windward side, and some of these CECs found there include caffeine, which is a nervous uh, system stimulant that we consume a lot of. Uh, it has been found to have detrimental effects on coastal aquatic organisms, including things like neurotoxicity, developmental issues, and reproductive harm. Um, there's also sulfamethoxal, which is an antimicrobial that we also consume, which um, not as much as caffeine, but uh, it has been observed to have an effect on the groundwater microbial community, especially towards uh, nitrate reducing organisms. And finally, it's glyphosate, which is pretty common since it's the main ingredient in Roundup. So as a herbicide, it's used on many residential lawns and then can be traveled through our surface runoff. But it's also been observed to go through our groundwater movement um, in American Samoa and has been traced from groundwater into our coast and coral reefs. So I wanted to study these contaminants and their concentrations within the stream system, the Kaneohe watershed, uh, the Kahalu'u and Huimanu watershed. Um, and the interesting thing about these is that they're uh, sort of split. And the inland is a natural stream bed section, which uh, looks like the my picture on the bottom left with a uh, riparian vegetation and it's deeper, while the channelized portion, which is the orange, is very shallow, um, completely covered in cement and close to residential areas. Uh, so I wanted to see if these contaminant uh, inventories were different based on the section of the stream. And I also wanted to see um, if there's differences between the two streams themselves, because in the uh, figure to the right, um, that is a map of OSDS uh, density, including cesspools and septic tanks. And Kahalu'u is, has a much higher cesspool density than a huimanu, and um, two of the contaminants I observed, caffeine and sulfamethoxal, are found to be linked to cesspool leachate. So I wanted to observe if this had a effect on on the contaminant concentrations there. So um, for the first, I did an initial survey where I collected samples from these 20 sites throughout the whole stream system and measured them for contaminant concentrations as well as radon concentrations, which is a proxy for groundwater input. 
some hypotheses I had for my project included that stream environment will have an effect on the breakdown or attenuation of CEC concentrations, that CEC consumption influences the growth of microbial communities, which I would find by tracking cell density. And finally, that um, areas with high on-site sewage disposal system density will have higher concentrations of CECs connected to cesspool leaching, caffeine, and sulfamethyloxal. So these are the results from my initial survey throughout the summer 2021, where I tracked radon concentrations um, as well as contaminant concentrations. Um, as you can see, there are higher radon inputs within uh, Kahulu'u channelized, as well as a high point in the Huimanu stream bed, uh, as well as and the, all of the all of the contaminants were found in like every section throughout the stream system. Um, as for those plus and minus symbols, I did um, attenuation, which is um, basically seeing if the um, contaminant is reducing or is staying constant and potentially increasing within an area. So um, using the equation in the bottom left corner, I use the uh, concentrations and positive values, which is uh, the green pluses, meant that, um, that they were um, staying constant or potentially declining, while the minuses show that the contaminant in that area is staying constant or potentially increasing. So for caffeine and glyphosate um, in Kahalu'u, we see that they have a negative, while um, in our stream bed sections, we see there's more positive, which means it's more likely breaking down. And we um, also see that there are lower um, radon concentrations over there. Um, so from there, I saw that it was present, and I also saw that groundwater input is um, present as well. So to study how it's affecting microbial growth, I collected samples from four of the uh, sites within the stream system and two within the coastal area, and I filtered them for large particles and added the sample water back in and in individual treatment uh, containers where I then added concentrations of each contaminant in them. And then um, I collected samples over a period of two weeks to track cell growth using flow cytometry, as well as um, collecting samples at the beginning and end of the observation period to measure for each contaminant's concentration to see if it was breaking down and if there is like also corresponding cell density growth from that. Um, to go over, um, I checked cell density by taking um, samples every six hours for the first 40, 48 hours of the observation period and then every other day. And then I measured all these samples within the flow cytometer that measured cells per microliter. And then I analyzed this data and put them into growth curves to see if CEC presence in the treatment was influencing microbial growth. I also did have controls to see if the micro, if the um, contaminants were breaking down our, on their own. In our amended control, we did not add any uh, microbes added. We just really had the um, filtered and the contaminant, and um, we and if it wasn't breaking down, it would remain relatively constant, like in this caffeine treatment. And the unamended is no contaminant at all. So looking at Sulfamethoxyl at first, we see from the amended control that it's not breaking down, and we see in our treatments that it's not, it's remaining constant from um, the first period to after two weeks, which means sulfamethoxyl is most likely not breaking down and staying constant. For glyphosate, um, we see that it is breaking down a little bit in, um, in our treatment scenarios, especially within Ohuimanu. Uh, which is interesting uh, to see that it is um, going down in both upstream and channelized. Then finally for caffeine, we found um, some really interesting data where we find that it's not being, it's not, it's remaining relatively constant in our amended controls, which means not breaking down on its own, but it is like completely consumed in our stream um, sites from 15 parts really into almost below the level detection and um, within all of our stream sites. Though for coastal sites, we see that it's still um, not breaking down as much. 
but we do see in just two weeks, um, this caffeine can be consumed. As for microbial growth, uh, the first one on top shows the growth curves for each section from the upstream and channelized to the coastal sites. Uh, channelized and estuarine are shown to have much steeper growth curves than the other sites, uh, which could show that there's a difference in runoff input as well as microbial communities. Um, though for our treatment scenarios, when we compare the growth curves to the unamended control to the treatment scenarios um, on the bottom over there, we see that there's not much um, significant differences between them, which suggests that CEC presence isn't affecting microbe growth in, the, in these treatments. Um, though when we looked at it closer, um, at the caffeine treatments where they're being uh, consumed completely, we did find that there is some evidence of slight growth within these treatments when comparing them to controls. Um, and to the right on our bar graphs where we compared cell densities at their peak, we did see that in Ahuimanu and especially in Kahalu'u, there was a difference in cell density in, um, in, our, um, in our treatment compared to the control. So main points, uh, we did find that CEC presence is not influencing um, death cell density significantly within the Kahalu'u and Huimanu stream system, though um, it could be influencing overall metabolism when we do, when we're finding that um, glyphosate is being slightly consumed and caffeine is being completely consumed and that there's some evidence of growth in our caffeine treatments. Um, also, caffeine is shown to have a much shorter residence time uh, based on environment type, especially when it's being um, almost consumed in streams and not in our coast. And this is only in our surface um, runoff. And caffeine also travels for groundwater. Um, as well, um, finally, overall implications in our future question. So collected data supports the hypothesis of stream environment being a factor in CEC consumption. Um, Though we have obvious per persistence of CECs in coastal areas for glyphosate and sulfamethoxyl, which could potentially lead to the detrimental effects I described in the beginning. Um, and also uh, further study into CEC uh, inventory in Kaneohe Bay could be helpful in coastal monitoring, um, especially seeing um, what sort of microbes are growing um, in the presence of these CECs. I started to research this in the summer um, my data wasn't able to, um, to be done um, correctly, but um, one of the samples that we did find was um, in the genus of Pseudomonas, which um, has been known to um, species in there are connected to human infections. Um, so it'd be really interesting to look into that more. Um, I would like to thank everyone involved, including my mentors, Dr. Craig Nelson and Dr. Henrietta Delay. They really helped me a lot throughout this. Um, Dr. Kiana Frank for letting me work in her lab this summer to um, start to look into the effects on specific microbes and um, just everyone who's helped out. I, I wish I could name all of you, but that would take too much time. Um, and um, yeah, and thank you to my family, especially for the support. Um, thank you. Great job, Sophia. Okay, uh, yes, thanks, Craig. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions, uh, starting with students again? Okay, it uh, doesn't look so, so Ed. Um, Okay, Sophia, you mentioned that at the start, uh, cesspools and septic tanks. What's the difference? So the design of cesspools are like they're they're not meant to, to leak out at all. Uh, while septic and they're most like they're um, made to be just like um, you know, occasionally like uh, taken out and emptied. While um, septic tanks, their design um, is to sort is to um, treat the waste within it. And so um, some leachage um, is more okay for um, septic tanks, but for cesspools, it's more of a problem because um, there's still people, there's still like areas where 
like people are, are like not sure if they have cesspools or not. So they're, they're not being like emptied out routinely. And this leads to like leaching from that um, is even more of a problem into our groundwater. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Sophia? Okay, well, I'd like to thank all our speakers today, um, Tanner, Erickson, and Sophia, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, and yeah, so these students will be graduating from GES and we'll have another symposium at the end of fall as well for GES students. So thank you all for coming. Uh, good job to those that presented. Thank you.